welcome to episode 10 of the Everyday Expertise Podcast. I'm your host, Roland Martin, and I hope that today's conversation will expand your knowledge. Today I welcome Cam Stryker to the show. Cam is the only respiratory therapist that I know. In fact, I had not even heard of the profession before Cam started studying to become an RT. I learned so much from this conversation, as Cam does a great job of explaining all the things that a respiratory therapist does and the different cases that he sees. I hope that you will enjoy it and learn from his expertise. Welcome, Cameron, to Everyday Expertise. It's really good to have you here. Uh, yeah, thanks, Roland, for having me on. I'm thrilled to be here and really excited to talk today about what I do. Excellent. So tell me, what is it that you do? What is your work currently? Um, so I am I'm a registered respiratory therapist. Um, so my my work right now primarily involves hospital uh, inpatient, mostly critical care. Um, so this would be intensive care units, mm -hmm. emergency room, um, that type of work. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that's what I'm primarily involved in right now in terms of my gotcha, my, yeah. my daily work. Yeah, so I um, I don't know much about respiratory therapists. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I don't think I'd actually heard of the term until I saw or heard that you were getting into it a few years ago. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just curious if you have a brief description of, of what a respiratory therapist is. Mm -hmm. So are you a nurse? Yeah, so that's a common question. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not a nurse. Mm -hmm. It's a different profession entirely okay. uh, with a different uh, licensing body from nurses. Okay. Um, but we are registered the same way that nurses are registered in that we have to be registered with a licensing body okay. in order to be able to practice. Like uh, you had to write an exam? That's right. Yeah. 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 You have to write a licensing exam and pass the exam in order to to practice uh, the field. So in that, in that respect, it would be there are some very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, this is a question I get a lot because people often haven't heard about the field of respiratory mm -hmm. therapy. Um, so in general, I would say there are a few main uh, aspects to it, and it mostly focuses on uh, the cardio, which would be heart, and mm -hmm. pulmonary, which would be, be the lungs. Okay. Um, so we yeah. essentially are specialists in that area, and our main uh, work is to assist physicians with the diagnosis and treatment of heart and lung disorders. Okay. So that can be really anything from you might see a respiratory therapist working in a diagnostic lab where they're okay. doing diagnostic mm -hmm. tests. Um, you might see a respiratory therapist out in the community where they're doing home care, okay. uh, working with patients yeah. with more chronic uh, disorders. Right. And then you will see most respiratory therapists, the bulk of us would work in uh, an in inpatient setting in a hospital okay. uh, where we would do direct treatment with patients that have uh, a wide range of lung disorders. And okay. I'm sure we'll get into more detail about what that looks like yeah. later. Uh, but that would be kind of the broad overview of what a respiratory therapist does. Okay. So it's a, a fairly specialized um, techniques and things that you're doing um, on the body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our focus would be a little bit more narrow than a lot of other uh, professions out there. So, yeah, for example, okay. nursing would have a much uh, wider scope, right. uh, for example, than respiratory therapy, okay. where we would be more focused in on what we uh, do and, yeah, what we yeah. what we practice. So does that mean there are much fewer? or there's a lot fewer respiratory therapists in Ontario than nurses? Right. Or, yeah. yeah. So actually, uh, it's funny you asked that question because I pulled up those numbers. Okay. Because uh, yeah. I was actually curious myself. I didn't actually know what the exact numbers were. So in pulling up the numbers about uh, like RTs versus nurses, there are about 3,600 um, practicing RTs in Ontario okay. right now yeah. uh, compared to about 140,000 okay. nurses. <laughs> um, and then uh, for physicians, uh, right now it's about 15,000 physicians okay. in Ontario. Yeah. Um, so we would be a small field yeah. for sure compared to nursing, uh, for example. Well, I guess that, mm -hmm. that kind of explains why I hadn't heard of it until I um, knew someone that got into it because right. I hadn't had to deal with one from a 
health care for me or any loved ones and and it's there's not a lot exactly. in Ontario so it's, yep. it makes sense that I didn't know anyone that's, yep. that's in it so yeah that kind yeah. of explains that I guess yeah exactly a little bit yeah so we'll like you said we'll get more into um some of the specifics of what you do and some of the different things mm -hmm. that RTs do but um just a little bit more about you do you have hobbies interests outside of your work that you'd like to share right um so anyone that knows me uh you would you would know this about me as well i'm very heavily involved in music mm -hmm. um so essentially outside of work my i would consider music to be my main kind of hobby or even like something that i also kind of do on the side as a little bit of work right. as well i work a little bit in the music industry um so within the music world i think i have pretty much settled on two or three things that I really like to do mm -hmm. there. Uh, one of those would be uh, piano performance. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been playing piano for many years. Um, oh, goodness, I don't even know the exact number of years at this point. As a oh, child? Over 20. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, I would have started lessons when I was nine, nine years old. Okay. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, I've been doing it ever since. Um so I, I, I will perform in public or like whether it's, you know, fundraisers or concerts, recitals, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy doing that. And then um, the other thing musically that I really uh, am involved in and enjoy would be uh, choral conducting mm -hmm. um, and choirs, that type of thing. Whether it's directing or singing in a choir, I just love choral music. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my main passions. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Were those three things or were those, were you counting uh, two things? Oh, those are two. And then, well, I guess voice as well, or just like singing in oh, yeah. general. Right. Um, yep. Yeah. Learning about the human voice and uh, practicing singing and vocal technique and that type of thing. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Were you thinking of um, doing your career in music at any point or was that kind of always a, a sideline for you? It was definitely a consideration okay. for yeah. me. Um, so I would say my main interest in music started, or at least like where I got heavily interested in music would have been in my high school um, okay. years. Mm -hmm. So I did piano lessons as a kid, um, or like starting at nine. So like an older kid, I was an older beginner, Right. Yeah. but I didn't really get too involved in it until more the high school level. Okay. Um, so when I went off to high school, I went to Listowel mm -hmm. and at the time there was a well known choir program there. Um, the Listowel choir program was well known okay. at that time. And so I wanted to be involved in that. And they also happened, um, so I was in grade nine. It wasn't until grade 10 that I actually joined the choir. Okay. Uh, but it was at that time that they were also looking for an accompanist for the choir. Okay. So um, Listowel, at least with the music teacher that was there when I was there, her name was uh, Mrs. Clausens. Um, her goal was usually to have a student accompanist okay, um, instead yeah. of, you know, hiring someone right. in from the community. Um, she always wanted to give a student a chance to be the accompanist for the choir. So um, the accompanist that was for the choir, uh, when I went into grade 10, had actually, you know, was graduating. Mm -hmm. And so they needed an accompanist. Uh, so that was, I kind of stepped out and nice. was like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to try for this. And I went and did a little audition for her. Um, and we like a little interview type of thing. Okay. And, yeah. uh, she ended up giving me the position of a companist. So at that time, um, then I started realizing like, oh, I actually have to like work really, <laughs> really hard at this. Yeah. Um, it's not something that you can, that I could just, you know, like, I was still young in right. my musical formation at that time. So, uh, but in doing that in like putting in the work and putting in the practice hours and stuff for that position, I found that I really, really enjoyed it. Okay. Um, and nice. yeah. my love for choral music in particular, um, was really nurtured, I would say okay. during that time. Yeah. Um, so I participated in high school choir all throughout, uh, for grades 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I wasn't at the piano, like if it was an acapella, 
uh, song or whatever, I would, you know, sing in the choir. Yeah. Um, so that was really when it was during those years that I really fell in love with the whole choir, choral music scene and uh, singing in a choir, okay. playing in things like that. Yeah. Um, so I distinctly remember having conversations with Mrs. Clausens about, you know, whether or not I should pursue music mm -hmm. as a career. Um, and it was something that I, it was always in the back of my mind um, as something to pursue. Okay. Yeah. But I ultimately came to decide when I was entering university that music in and of itself, I don't think was going to be my main focus career wise. Okay. Right. Um, and there's another experience. Maybe I should just throw it in here. Sure. Now. Yeah, go ahead. I, I may as well. Um, that kind of led me to that um, and is what got me interested in the medical field. Okay. Yep. Um, so this other experience has to do with one of my cousins okay. um, had a rare blood disorder um, that essentially required her to have have to have a bone marrow transplant. Okay. Um, and so this procedure took place at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, and our families were fairly close. Mm -hmm. So one t uh, one day when this procedure was done, we went down to Sick Kids okay. and visited their family at the hospital there. And I just distinctly remember at that time, I believe I would have been around fifteen or sixteen. I don't know the exact okay. age. Um, but the, in going into the hospital and with that experience, just having this overwhelming sense of, like, this is what I want to do. Okay. Like, I yeah. want to do something with medicine, something in the medical field. Um, so at that time, uh, so I pretty much came home from that trip, a little trip, I guess, to right. the hospital, yep. um, and started researching, in particular, uh, medical uh, programs like MD mm -hmm. programs to become a physician. Uh, and so my goal uh, through sorting all of this out, my interest in music and my interest in medicine, like how can I possibly, you know, get them to work together? Right. I discovered in my research that in order to get into an MD program in Ontario, you don't actually need to have a specific undergrad. Okay. So your undergrad can be in music for instance or see, yeah. you know history or biology you can choose pretty much uh, whatever field you want to study in undergrad so long as you meet certain prerequisite courses okay which... so there are some that you would have had to take that's right okay yeah so i can't remember the specifics but i know um there would have been there was a requirement for a physiology course okay. and a chemistry course um no physics actually okay um, at least not in ontario i know down in the states physics would be required okay. as well um so then essentially that was how i decided in going into my undergraduate field of study of music okay um that i could do the music Mm -hmm. uh, undergrad and still keep the door open for the possibility of medical school after that okay yeah um in, if uh, making sure that i took the right prerequisite courses right so for me it seemed kind of like the best of both worlds yeah. at the time in that i could study what i was really passionate about and really delve into the whole music end of things but still keep the door open uh for the medical end of things um so that's kind of what happened in those early early years with that gotcha um and kind of how i ended up where i am today yeah a little bit so you went to university for music specifically for your undergrad then right for like four years of a music like yes. a music degree yeah that's yeah. right yeah okay. so i did a four-year music degree at wilford laurier mm -hmm. um and my focus on that uh my degree is specifically in music education and okay. mu music theory. So I, I did a double major, okay. essentially. Mm -hmm. And then I did um, various science courses. So I did general chemistry, organic chemistry, um, human physiology, biochemistry, uh, and, and a few others that I can't remember. And were but... those all ones that you were required if you were going to go on to medical school? Yeah, those were more taken with the, yeah, the goal of going on to medical okay, school yep. with that. So was mm -hmm. that still your plan once you graduated? 
It was. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so kind of what happened was I did do a medical school application. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And I interviewed at University of Toronto for their MD program. Mm-hmm. Ultimately was unsuccessful in getting, like passing that final stage, okay. uh, passing the interview stage. Uh, so that year didn't work out. The next year I um, applied again okay. um, and it didn't work out that year either. So at that point I was looking at other medical options as okay, well. Okay, got you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was kind of because of those doors closing that you went and started ser- or that's right searching yeah. out other fields and that kind of thing yeah yeah exactly i i kind of had this sense that i really wanted to be in medicine mm-hmm. but i didn't know exactly what area yeah. so i pretty much spent a year um that year after university um looking you know researching all these different medical okay. programs physiotherapy audiology occupational mm-hmm. therapy nursing I discovered respiratory therapy in amongst that. Okay. And yep. then uh, kind of narrowed down my options and uh, here, I, here I am. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Do you think it, uh, do you think it hurt you at all in getting into medical school that you had done a, a music degree or was that not supposed to be a, I a know. Factor at so all? medical schools in Ontario are very open um, okay. to, so. to students from really any background. Um, I actually know personally um, two people that have gone off to medical school having a music degree as okay. their undergrad. Yep. Yeah. Nice. I, and I'm sure there are more as yeah. well, but I, I know of at least two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know there are, when you were describing that, I know that there are like pre-med undergrad degrees that you can, right. that you can do. So I didn't know if that yep. like gets you a better chance. Or yeah. If it's a... I, I don't know for sure. Um, maybe indirectly, possibly yeah, yeah. i don't know i know mcmaster has like a pre pre-med health sciences or something okay, program yeah. i kind of forget exactly what it's called but that program tends to see a fair amount of its students go off to medical school okay whether yeah. that's like a selection bias of the program yeah. and the type of people applying to that program that, right yeah that could be a possibility of what's going on there as well yeah. or the program itself i don't entirely know but yeah mm-hmm. um this is maybe one more question here on on music before we get into mm-hmm. respiratory therapy. Yeah. Do you see do you see any connections or ways that you've benefited from your um, music studies, your interest in music, all the work that you've done in music that that benefits you in in your medical work, or are they pretty disconnected? I I would definitely say there's been influence and that it's been beneficial for me um one of the main ways actually would be just this idea of being able to perform under pressure okay so as a musician you have to you know you get up on stage or you'll have to perform a solo concert um there can be an element of pressure there right um, in order to perform and likewise at least with my current profession um, it depends what you're doing in medicine, but there, um, there are high stress situations <laughs> that I'm involved in where you have to be able to more or less perform to the best of your ability at any given moment and just being able to go into a situation and do it. Yeah. So I would say like music would ha- helps with that because you have to do a little bit of that in music. Um, that would be, would be one way I would yeah. suppose well, that I, I could see it I being thought of about benefit. That, that yeah, part of it, yeah. That, but, I, uh, that I've noticed. And especially since you've done performance and mm-hmm. and and had that experience. So, yeah, mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. Good. So going back to your studies and um, getting into respiratory therapy, had you heard of, had you heard of it at all before you started researching um, that year between or after university or was that the, your first first introduction to it as well that was my first introduction yeah so i had never heard of respiratory therapy up until that point okay um i really just stumbled across it through um kind of uh looking through the list so i looked at conestoga college um for programs Mm -hmm. they offer in the health sciences and they have a list there of like everything that they offer right um you know register practical nursing their joint rn program with mcmaster Mm -hmm. and then i noticed oh there were also things like um occupational therapy aid or physical therapy aid things like that Mm -hmm. 
And then I noticed respiratory therapy as an option. And I was like, oh, that sounds very interesting. Like, I don't entirely know what that means. So I went to the program page, looked at it, kind of read the description. And um, I was like, oh, that sounds like something that I would be potentially interested in. Okay. So I actually emailed the coordinator of the program um, at Conestoga and set up a meeting with him Mm -hmm. to discuss the program, um, talk about like, what is respiratory therapy? Because, you know, a web page gives you a little bit of information, but it doesn't give you that much information on the day to day. Like what does a respiratory respiratory therapist actually do? Um, it's kind of hard to glean that out. Um, especially when you're unfamiliar with the field. So I set up a meeting with the program coordinator and went to the college and we chatted and he showed me the labs and he showed me ventilators um, that we use in ICU, like p- patients that are on life support. Okay. Um, and he told me a little bit about that and uh, talked to me a bit about that and what respiratory therapists do in that regard. Okay. And I was pretty much hooked at that okay. point. I, I had decided at that point that this was a field that I could easily see myself enjoying. Was there yeah. something in particular that jumped out about it or? I think it was, there were a few things about it. Um, mostly the ability to be involved in critical care. Okay. Um, so that was something that I felt attracted to in the medical field Mm -hmm. was more the critical care end of things you like the pressure yeah Yeah. well i don't know (laughs) like i i don't i've gotten used to it now i guess Uh, in school at a few times it was a little bit much but um Uh yeah uh but that and then one of the other things that i really liked about respiratory therapy is you cover all ages so from newborn to geriatric patients okay and everything in between um, and a wide range of clinical situations. Okay. So um, whether it's, you know, helping a newborn infant take its first first breaths if it's not breathing okay. or like, you know, being pr- uh, part of that type of a scenario all the way to end of life um, palliative medicine, mm-hmm. being involved in um, that end of things, um, critical care, chronic care. There are just really a lot of uh, options for respiratory therapists in that regard. Yeah. So that appealed to me as well mm-hmm. uh, about the program. So you signed up then? I did. Shortly yeah. After, so did... yeah, I submitted an application um, and was accepted and uh, then went off to the program okay. and started the program. How long yeah. has it been since you finished that now? Uh, so let's see, I would have finished in 2017. Okay. So a little over two years at this point, okay. I think. Nice. Yeah. I think I've been a practicing RT for about two and a half years. Yeah. Something around that. Was it hard to find a job in it or were there plenty of opportunities? There are a fair amount of opportunities, okay. nice. uh, okay. opportunities in respiratory therapy. Um, that you will primarily be finding your first job at, so when you do the respiratory therapy program, you have to do clinical um, okay. placement cool. and we, can maybe talk later about what that entails and what you do in that. But um, your first job usually tends to be at the hospital that you did your clinical placement at. Um, For me, it actually was a little bit different. My particular hospital that I was a student at wasn't actually hiring Uh, anyone when I graduated. So I wasn't able to get a job there right off the bat. Um, So I ended up taking a home care position oh okay um and doing more community respiratory therapy which was actually a great experience it just gave me an appreciation for another side of respiratory therapy that you don't generally um focus on too much in school Mm -hmm. um and then after a period of time um the hospital that i was a student at had positions open up okay and i applied to those and ended up getting a job oh nice back in the hospital um, and mm-hmm. then that's where I've been ever since. Very good. Yeah, we talked about some of the steps that uh, kind of led you to this point. Was there anything else that you had wanted to share on um, on how you became a respiratory therapist? Or did you pretty much cover what you had thought of there? I think that more or less covers, yeah, the journey kind of to respiratory yeah. therapy. So, yeah. yeah, tell me, is there anything significant that, that you remember from your training that... Uh, 
that stands out that'll maybe give a, give me a little bit of a picture of some of the things that a respiratory therapist does. So yeah, what did right. what did your training look like? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the respiratory therapy program is a three year um, advanced college diploma. Okay. Um, in Ontario and I think across. Uh, Canada, it's the same. So essentially, the program is in two parts. You have the first part of the program is didactic. So that would be your classroom (laughs) work. And then the second part of the program is clinical. Um, where you actually are on site in a hospital doing clinical rotations. So you were working with actual respiratory therapists during that time? That's or? right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you would, um, uh, yeah, I, I'll elaborate that on a second, I think. Yeah. Um, so the didactic portion um, would be all your coursework. So in respiratory therapy school, we did um, courses um such as like general anatomy and physiology, Mm -hmm. um, basic science, including, you know, chemistry, physics, a little bit of biology as well. And then um, you had other more specialized courses. Then as you would go through the program, Mm -hmm. uh, you would have courses on mechanical ventilation, uh, for example, um, because that really is one of the main focus points of respiratory therapy Mm -hmm. um so every single semester you had a course on mechanical ventilation and it would just get progressively more and more advanced as you went along Mm -hmm. with that um actually maybe i should clarify that term sure um, yeah in case so mechanical ventilation is essentially what we do in medicine Um, If a patient is on, we generally refer to this as life support uh, in the general public, Mm -hmm. um, where we take over the breathing for a patient. Um, So that's essentially mechanical ventilation. So it's a machine aiding in the breathing or doing the breathing? Yeah, yeah. So a ventilator is essentially, yeah, uh, a really fancy air compressor. Okay. Uh, for yep. humans, I guess, for lack of a better, better word. So it's a machine that we hook up. So um, in order to do this, uh, you need to put a breathing tube into your patient. Okay. Um, so or, or the medical term would be an endotracheal tube. Um, so this is done by a procedure called intubation. Okay. So yep. you use um, a curved rounded blade uh, that we call a laryngoscope that goes into the patient's mouth and kind of partway down their throat and you use that tool to open up a view of the vocal cords okay and then once you see the vocal cords you then take your breathing tube and you advance it in between the vocal cords and it essentially sits in the trachea okay um, which is the tube that leads to your lungs so it's not going into the lungs or it It doesn't go go, yeah it doesn't go all the way down into the lungs it um so your breathing tube the tip of your breathing tube will sit approximately anywhere from three to five centimeters above what we call the carina and the carina is that branch between your left and your right lung okay so when your trachea divides into your uh, left bronchus and your right bronchus um we call that the carina. So your breathing tube sits in between the vocal cords and the carina. Okay. Um, and then that would be the proper placement of that. Gotcha. So yeah. when a patient has trouble breathing, is it not the lungs that are the issue? Is it, it something be, in the trachea or the mouth or something like that? Or? It can be all of those. Okay. Yeah. So you're trying to bypass the... It'll depend. Yeah, it will depend on the clinical scenario as to whether we even uh, consider intubation or not. Okay. Um, So, um, yeah, maybe maybe when we talk about disease processes later, maybe we can get into a bit more of some of that, and um, maybe at that point. So you were you would be practicing. Do you call that process intubating or? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you, that's. Did you practice that during your training? And that's clinicals? right. Yeah. yeah. So in school um, during we would also have so we would have classroom work and then we would also have lab work where mm. we would have to go to a sim lab and you'd have to demonstrate certain skills. So intubation is one of the skills that mm-hmm. you have to demonstrate and be competent in in order to graduate as a respiratory therapist. Um, so. 
<clears throat> that would kind of be the first two years of the program would mm -hmm. be the classroom and the skills and the skills are actually marked as well okay so about every four months in those first two years you would have to do a skills competency where okay. you would go in and there would be a clinical scenario you didn't necessarily know what it would be um and you would have to demonstrate competency in whatever skill they're asking you to do gotcha. so whether that was intubation or setting up a ventilator or uh, other procedures which we'll maybe talk about yeah as well are you doing stuff like blood pressure and that kind of thing too or is it yeah mostly, so yeah. we would learn yeah we would have learned all of that okay um i would yeah i would occasionally do a blood pressure in hospital usually the nurses are okay. on that yeah. and they're there and they're doing it already before i get there right okay. so usually i don't have to worry but like if the nurse hasn't done it yet then i'll just do it yeah. myself type of so, thing so in the um in the lab in your when you were in school would you have been doing these things on dummies or mm -hmm. or what real people or yeah um mannequins yeah. for the most part um some of the skills we actually practice on ourselves like okay. on our classmates yeah. so for example yeah blood pressures that type of thing it's really hard to, you can't really do that on a mannequin right yeah um it's a lot easier blood pressure on a real person oh, for right. example yeah. as opposed to a mannequin um but yeah, certain skills like the intubations, for example, obviously you can't practice that on your lab partner because yeah. that would be very invasive. <laughs> um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So that was, you said kind of the first two years were? were yeah, the first two years would be your that. classroom and your lab work. And then at that point, uh, going into your third year, then you were assigned a hospital. Okay. Uh, to rotate at mm -hmm. um, so then you began your clinical rotations um, so clinical rotations for respiratory therapy included um, primarily the focus is on intensive care unit okay um, so I would say almost half of your clinical rotation which is eight months long uh, is spent in intensive care okay and then the other half would be spent in emergency um, general medical floors, uh, pediatric and neonatal okay. specific rotations, and then also uh, community. Care okay, so rotations. you did some. Uh, you did some clinical work in the community as well. Yes. So it wasn't completely new to you. That's you right. There, yeah. yeah. So you do a little bit of it in the actual program, but very little. I think my community rotation was three days okay. long so, in yeah. my clinical. <laughs> Um, year so not not very long yeah um and then oh the diagnostic end of things so pulmonary function okay. testing okay um yep. mm -hmm. would, would have been a rotation in and of itself so that's so when you say diagnostic mm -hmm. i kind of think of like finding out what disease or something like that someone has is that that's is that right correct? yeah yeah okay. yeah so that's more or less this so a pulmonary function test is a very specific diagnostic test okay. um, that a doctor might order for a patient mm -hmm. that they um, suspect has lung disorder okay. of some kind. Um, and this test essentially, um, some people may have done this before, uh, but it's the test where we put you in this box, essentially, with a little mouthpiece that goes in your mouth. And we'll get you to do all sorts of things like, okay. you know, take a deep breath in and then blow out as fast and as hard as you can and we're going to be measuring various things like how quickly you can blow out the air that's oh, okay. in your lungs so that gives us a measure of like your muscle strength and stuff like that uh, for your respiratory muscles in particular um, or if there's obstruction right if there's something obstructing airflow in your lungs or you know one of the main bronchi or something or if you have asthma Right. Uh, your flows would be decreased okay um, mm -hmm. because there's an obstruction there right um, the other thing uh, that we can look at with those would be lung volumes so how much air is actually okay. in your lungs mm -hmm. and this is actually much trickier to measure than you would initially think okay and for one one main reason is because your lungs have something called functional reserve capacity so there's a an amount of air left in your lungs that never 
comes out. Like you can't right. actually expel that air. Otherwise, your lungs would completely collapse. Okay. So there's hmm. always a little bit of air lung, uh, left in your lungs, um, even when you feel like you've gotten rid of everything. Like if you exhale until you can't get rid of any air whatsoever, there's still going to be air left there. In fact, it's usually around about a liter of okay. air well. left in your lungs um, at the end of maximal exhalation. So to measure that volume of air, like how much air is actually left in your yep. lungs, is actually, well, it's a bit of a conundrum because you can't actually expel it through a mouthpiece and right, measure, yeah. measure the amount of volume. So these boxes, um, essentially what they can do is they seal themselves off. So it's a closed environment. And I, uh, I would have... I should have maybe reviewed this, but I forget the exact physics of how it how it works. But um, there's uh, we get the patients to do like these panting exercises, okay. which then moves the chest wall and it causes change in the pressure in the box. So the box oh, okay. itself can notice these very small pressure changes. Um, and somehow using that, there's a, this big, long calculation that okay. <laughs> goes on and it essentially figures out how much air is left in your lungs. Okay. Um, so it's a, yeah, when you think about it, it's actually not as straightforward yeah. uh, to make that measurement as one might think. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be one aspect of pulmonary function testing. Um, the other aspect would be often exercise related. Oh, so okay. this could be like stress testing for patients that have heart disorders. Mm -hmm. So often respiratory therapists that work in a pulmonary function lab would also be involved in cardiac stress testing. Okay. Um, so they would be the ones that uh, would put patients on a treadmill, get them to, you know, do the running and see how their heart is doing. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a whole fee. <coughs> excuse me. That's a whole field in and of itself. Um, is the diagnostic end of okay. respiratory therapy. So would that be, would you have been in a lab to do those those clinicals or where is that uh, diagnostic work done? The um, So it can be done in a lab, okay. yeah. So um, there are independent um, out-of-hospital pulmonary function labs oh, okay. for sure. Yeah. Um, when I did them... Uh, when I did my rotation, it was at the one that was at the hospital. Oh, they're, they'll have yeah. those labs at the hospital as That's well. That's right. Oh, so right. you'll have yeah. them um, both in hospital and out of hospital. Yeah. Very good. So, yeah, that, uh, I mean, gives kind of a summary anyway of uh, some of the training that you did. Is there anything else that you were going to say there? Or is that... Uh, does that I, sum up pretty well? Yeah, I think that's good. That's kind of an overall view of yeah. the training and... Well, I guess the only other thing to add would be, so once you're finished, your clinical, uh, yeah. um, there you then come back, at least Conestoga College did it this way, you come back to the school, you did about a week of um, kind of synthesis. They call it synthesis okay. week, where you like put everything together, kind of review, kind of review topics. Um, they had a couple of like review lectures on, you know, main things that you need to mm -hmm. absolutely know kind of in preparation for the CBRC um, exam. So right. CBRC, I think uh, Canadian board of respiratory care, I believe is what it stands for. Um, and they're the organization that creates the licensing exam. Mm -hmm. that you need to write in order to graduate. So in order to graduate from the actual program, you have to write Conestoga, Conestoga's exam. They have oh, okay. a comprehensive exam. So you have to pass that exam in order to graduate. Right. If you don't pass that exam, like if you've passed every single course, but you don't pass that exam, you can't graduate okay. until oh. you pass that exam. Um, so right at the end of your program, you write the comprehensive Conestoga exam. And then about a month later, you write the national licensing okay. exam. And then once you passed the licensing exam, you have your full license and you can practice as a full respiratory therapist. Okay. In, in the interim, until that happens, um, you're called what's, uh, what we call a graduate respiratory okay. therapist, which means you can work as a respiratory, as an RT, um, but you can't, there are certain things that you can't oh, do, gotcha. like certain procedures that you would either have to do under direct supervision or just not at all yeah. until 
you have your full license. So you said national. Are you licensed in all of Canada or just in Ontario? Yeah. So actually, it's one of the nice things about the RT okay. license is it is national. Um, yeah. It is at the national level. So I could, if I needed to, pick up, you know, tomorrow and move to New Brunswick or okay. move to Alberta and be able to practice. Very good. Yeah. It's actually not unheard of uh, for new graduates, uh, particularly out west. There are there's a lot of jobs out west oh, okay. for RTs. So I know a couple of my classmates immediately upon graduating pretty much moved out west. I see. Yeah. yeah. Very good. All right. So you've uh, mentioned some of the procedures through training and um, things like that that you're responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought we could maybe get a little bit more into some of the yeah. things that you do on a regular I don't know how often you're doing some of these right. things but yeah maybe let's start with what are some of the most typical procedures that you're responsible for right so respiratory therapists um, in terms of procedures that we do the main ones would be intubation which I talked about mm -hmm. and I would say we don't do that on a super regular basis okay essentially that's a shared responsibility between uh, the respiratory therapist or uh, or the physician so it so they they're able to do them as well like they don't right. need to call on you to to do it or we will so anytime a patient is intubated we have to be there but oh, we, okay. we won't necessarily be the ones doing the intubation okay um it'll just kind of depend on the scenario or like whether the physician wants to do the intubation themselves or not okay um so but we do have to be trained in it in those scenarios when a physician is not oh, okay directly there so you can do it without a without a physician there you can in more of a uh, like a critical okay. situation like code for yeah example. well that was gonna be my next question yeah. are, are most of them done like in critical situations like that or is yeah. it okay yeah. like an emergency so, or yeah exactly so a lot of intubations um are occurring because we're in a critical situation like someone or stopped breathing or yeah, yeah so this would be so let's um typical instances of when you might intubate someone would be let's say um they're yeah coming in in a cardiac arrest into mm -hmm. emergency for example so, so that means that their heart has stopped right yeah. yeah so their heart has stopped or they've had a massive heart attack um mm -hmm. whatever so that would be an instance when you'd be intubating someone. Okay. Um, another instance would be um, possibly a patient that has had a severe stroke okay. or brain bleed, um, mm -hmm. and they are not able to protect their airway, we call it. Oh, okay. So that would mean like they no longer have any of their reflexes, like their swallowing reflex, their gag reflex, or their cough reflex. Okay. All of those reflexes would be... Um, not working at I the see. moment due to whatever is happening neurologically. Okay. So a patient like that, we would also intubate for what we deem purposes of airway protection okay. so that they don't, you know, get saliva or other right. things down into their lungs and cause them to potentially get a really bad, what we call aspiration pneumonia, which can be quite okay. severe. So they might even be breathing. It's just that That's you're right. protecting against that. That's right. Okay. So they might be breathing on their own, yeah. but they just can't protect their airway, for okay. example. So in like a cardiac arrest situation or a heart mm -hmm. attack, how does um, intubating help because isn't doesn't the heart need to be beating as well, or is it like are you doing both things at the so, same time? So yeah, it'll depend on the specific scenario. Sometimes, like you'll be going into a code situation, and they'll be doing the compressions right. on the chest, and you'll be intubating at the same time. Okay. Um, but other times, the heart will still be pumping, but the patient either they can't maintain their oxygenation levels, um, or yeah, that would be kind of the main thing. They can't maintain okay. oxygenation or they're just not breathing effectively. So they might be doing something that we call agonal breathing, where their breathing is very sporadic or not okay. very, um, it's just not effective ventilation. Okay. Yep. So if your ventilation is not effective, um, what happens is your carbon dioxide levels go up oh, in your yeah. blood. And then that would consequently push your pH level down, um, make you more acidic. And so then we need to 
take over the breathing essentially to get that carbon dioxide level back down into normal range okay. and then that would correct your ph as well okay um so okay. there's a lot to like dissect there in terms of the medicine behind that right. I, i'm yeah. not sure into how much detail we want to go about that. yeah but um well it certainly is intubations certainly happen um in a wide range of scenarios okay. we can be intubating yeah because it's an emergency and we need to secure the airway and we need to make sure that the patient is breathing. We can also be intubating electively. And this you would see for surgery, for example, okay. um, depending on the type of surgery that's being performed, um, the anesthesiologist, uh, who's a medical doctor, uh, would be intubating you for that procedure. Okay. And mm -hmm. that could be just for a short amount of time. Okay. Um, but they may also choose other options as well. There sure. are, um, so I guess we could talk about other options besides intubation. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, what else do you do? <clears throat> so there are, so intubation, the breathing tube goes through the vocal cords, um, and into the trachea mm -hmm. essentially. Um, there are then other airway devices called supraglottic airway devices, and these essentially sit right above the vocal cords. Um, so laryngeal mask airway or LMA is one of the most common okay. um, devices that we use for that. So this is a device that would go down the throat, but it doesn't actually go through the vocal cords. Oh, it okay. essentially just sits right on top of the vocal cords and it has like a little cup on the end of it that kind of hugs the hugs the larynx, okay. um, which is the where your vocal cords are housed. Um, and then it creates a decent seal. It doesn't create a perfect seal, but it works well enough that you can provide ventilation through that, like with the bag resuscitator device. Um, okay. And it is often used in surgeries if they don't want to do a full intubation. Okay. Um, it's a very common device to be used with uh, EMS services. Oh, if okay. they are out in the field and they just don't have the time or they don't have someone that can actually intubate, okay. uh, they can just put an LMA in. So is it preferred if, if, uh, if possible to use that versus intubation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because it's less intrusive. Yeah. Um, it can be, yeah, so generally if you can use an LMA, um, more for elective uh, okay. type yeah. events, you would go that route gotcha. as opposed to fully intubating someone. Does it look different on the outside to the untrained eye or is it similar looking if someone's had that procedure versus intubation? Yeah, um, it would probably look similar, like the procedure itself would yeah. look similar um, in that both of them have a tube that okay. sticks yeah. out of That's your mouth, I was essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So in that way, they would look similar. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's just what's going on in the throat, kind of the throat, and whether it's going through the vocal cords or not, yeah. that's that's the difference. Yeah, which you can't see. Right well, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, mm -hmm. if I would actually like see both procedures, if I'd be able to tell the right, difference. Right, right. If yeah. you were just looking, if yeah, to to the untrained eye, if you were just looking at a patient that had a tube sticking out of their mouth, right. it would be hard to differentiate which one actually has a breathing okay. tube versus or like an endotracheal tube versus an LMA or something. Mm -hmm. um, but there are differences on them, so you can tell just by okay. looking. Yeah. Um, but it would just you would need to know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, other procedures that RTs do. Um, we do a lot of arterial blood gases. Um, so this is a procedure um, where essentially you're taking a needle and you're essentially drawing blood. Okay. But except we aren't drawing from a vein, you know, most blood draws that people are used to having performed are done from a vein, right? Um, so whether it's the back of the hand or kind of the crux of the elbow, um, the antecubital, we call it, um, that's where most people would be used to their blood. So if I go into a lab to get blood work done, I'm getting it from a, from a vein? Usually from a vein, yeah. yeah. Um, what we do um, is we actually draw blood from the artery, from an artery, um, in particular, the radial artery. So this would be the artery that's kind of on your thumb side. And so okay. whenever someone says, you know, check your pulse, um, that's the artery that you're feeling. Okay. That would be your radial artery. Mm -hmm. So that is the vessel that we are 
aiming for when we're going for an arterial blood okay. gas. And this would be ordered only in very specific circumstances. Um, it just gives us, uh, in particular, it gives us a much better picture of the oxygenation oh, of okay. blood because um, essentially what happens is blood goes through the lungs mm -hmm. and it gets oxygenated by the lungs. And then that blood consequently gets pumped out to the rest of your body uh, first going through the arteries and then the capillaries and then it returns right. via the veins so the arteries carry fully oxygenated blood right essentially so it gives you a better picture from the artery of exactly how much the lungs are actually that's transferring right. oxygen yeah. to the blood that's yeah. right so if we want to know how well your lungs are functioning in terms of oxygenation we have to draw that from an artery if we draw it from a vein your body has already gonna has already taken oxygen out of the blood to use it. Right. So now we we don't really know like was that from the body taking oxygen out or was that from the lungs right. not working properly. So to get the best picture of lung oxygenation, um, we have to draw it from an artery. So is that procedure trickier than drawing blood from a vein? I would say it's about the same. Okay. Um, it's just slightly different technique, but okay. in terms of like. Either, either way, you're poking a blood vessel, so the risks are more or less the same okay. in terms of you can cause you know rupture or hematoma, which would be bruising, that okay. type of yeah. thing. Um, but the blood would be under more pressure? It is there? under more pressure. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a more pressurized vessel. Yeah. Um, the other thing is veins you can often see, the artery you can't Oh, really? Okay. See. Is it in deeper or not? It's deeper. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit deeper. And uh, so essentially you have to go by feel. So when I'm going for an, uh, a radial artery to poke one, right. um, I'm literally feeling where the pulse is on the arm mm -hmm. and trying to pinpoint that and then poke at where I feel the pulse the strongest. Okay. Have you ever messed up and gotten a vein instead of an artery? I have. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell? Uh, you can usually tell. Okay. Yeah. First of all, like usually you're filling, like your syringe will fill much more quickly with the artery oh, yeah. because it is under more pressure. Yeah. And then also with the artery, the blood is usually more red. Like oh, okay. It, yeah. So is it a visible difference? There is a visible okay. difference. Yeah. yeah. So if you're getting like a slow filling kind of dark burgundy color it's like okay i've i've gotten a vein and there is it is a bit tricky because there is a vein that runs very close oh, I see. to the radial artery so there is a vein that's okay. in the vicinity that you can potentially so then do you have hit. to tell your patient um we're gonna have to I'm do this again have to poke you again <laughs> yeah which is that must be fun. not what they want to hear <laughs> yeah probably not <laughs> <laughs> along with that so in uh, along with the whole, we don't want to poke patients all the time. So our very sick ICU patients where we're wanting to monitor this mm -hmm. on a regular basis, we obviously don't want to have to poke them every single time that we need blood okay. from the artery. So what RTs will do in that scenario is we'll put in what's called an arterial line. So this is essentially a line that goes into the artery that mm -hmm. allows us to draw blood from it oh, okay the, the other advantage of that is it also allows us to me uh, measure the blood pressure oh okay directly because we can actually there's a little transducer that goes on to the line and it can measure the blood okay. pressure from that line sitting in the artery so is this kind of the opposite of an iv or not yeah um sort of i guess in a way in that an IV you're usually injecting and with an arterial line you're usually withdrawing. Like um, is it is it something that stays in there in, it, in the artery permanently or it uh no, not permanently. No, okay. So not... it can be it will be removed. No, I mean like but, but for the time that they're in the Yeah in the hospital will it be in and you just come and draw from it occasionally or usually for the time that they're in ICU. So we only allow um at least at all the hospitals that I work at, and I feel like most hospitals would be this way. We only allow arterial lines in patients that are in ICU okay. or emerge. Yeah. Like we wouldn't allow them on the floors. Okay. For a few, excuse me, for a few reasons. Um, one of them being you can't inject any medications into an arterial line. Okay. So when you have a patient on the floors, they might have IVs in, you don't want them to have an arterial line that 
someone could accidentally inject a medication oh, okay. into because um, floors nurses aren't trained with arterial lines okay um so there is potential for error to happen there whereas an icu nurse for example would know that they can't inject any medications into an arterial line and they would know you know what the arterial line looks like and yeah yeah so are you just drawing from them or are you also putting them in and so setting we, them up as well yeah so we um the rts usually set them up and insert them and okay. then yeah. the nurses actually usually draw from oh, them. okay yeah. so your your procedure with that is to actually insert it that's and, right yeah. yeah yeah i will occasionally draw like you know if i see the nurse is really busy and oh, yeah. i don't want to bother them and i'm in the room anyway and i want a blood gas then i'll just draw it myself okay. yeah. but um mm-hmm. yeah anything else that you wanted to mention there as far as what you do so i guess it could maybe help to talk about kind of a day in the life mm-hmm. and kind of like what a day looks like yeah it was, um, i was actually gonna ask you about that so that's great yeah so my day would start by coming to the hospital um right now with covid we have to wear our street clothes in we are not allowed to wear any um scrubs in or out like oh okay in so or you, out of the hospital so you've been used to coming to work all dressed dressed for the job often i would wear like before covid i would often bring home a clean pair of scrubs the day before okay and then like wear them into the hospital mm-hmm. and then change out of them when i left oh yeah um, like i i would not wear dirty scrubs outside of the hospital right but um even now with covid you're not even allowed to do that so you have to go through your screening your COVID screening, and then you pick up your scrubs and then change into your scrubs. Um, We usually um, have an RT huddle at the beginning of each day where um, the team leader for the respiratory therapy team would come in and give us any updates on, you know, any research maybe or any policy changes that have happened recently, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that the whole department is up to date on any recent changes and then the rest of your day would depend on what er- whatever area you're assigned to. So okay. I'll talk about ICU because that's mostly um, where you end up working. Okay. So uh, if you're assigned to ICU, the beginning of your shift, uh, you would go and assess all of your patients that are in ICU that would require an R- RT to assess them. So these okay. would be mainly the patients that are on Um, a mechanical ventilator okay so these are the patients that have the breathing tube in they're hooked up to a breathing machine for Mm -hmm. lack of a better term which we call a ventilator Um, so you would go and assess all of those patients and make any changes that would be necessary at that time okay Um, usually when by the time you get that done that usually takes depending on how many patients you have anywhere from you know, two to four hours to do your first kind of set of rounds. Um, In the meantime, the doctor is also going to be doing their rounds. So you will connect with the physician during that time about any patients that you either have concerns about or you think, you know, things could be advanced. Um, We could try weaning them, for example, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. And you'll just tell the doctor what your plan is with each patient. Um, the doctors at both the hospitals that I work at pretty much leave this entirely up to the RTs okay. in terms of yeah. how quickly to do the weaning process and when the breathing tube should come out, that type of thing. So you're making some of those decisions on specifically within your your spoke your That's scope right. of uh, of knowledge and experience there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or at the very least, it's a discussion for sure with the physicians where they want to know like what we think and what our assessments were and what we think how things should proceed yeah um so that kind of usually eats up the morning um and then you usually go on lunch by the time that that's done and then in the afternoon will be just general you know tying up any loose ends or performing any of those you know, procedures or tasks that we talked about in the morning okay. with yep. the doctor. So whether that's an extubation, which would be removing the breathing tube, mm-hmm. um, or 
you might be getting a new patient that you have to admit oh, yeah. or there might be a procedure like a bronchoscopy that's being performed that would be a procedure where we go down into the lungs with a little camera and oh, a flexible okay. fiber optic scope um, and you're looking around to see you know if there's any pathology um, so we might use this to help with a cancer diagnosis okay. where there's a tumor and we go down we take a biopsy from the tumor right. and then send it off to the lab um, things like that yeah you're yeah good. so uh, the day can be filled up very quickly yeah. with various procedures um, sometimes a patient will have to go for a special like for a scan like an mri or a ct scan so if they're on full ventilation and pretty much life support um, that's going to take a team of people to be able to move that patient from icu to the scanner and back again so okay. the rt would also uh, be heavily involved in that aspect yeah. of their care yeah. so um are you just working days or do you work some nights as well? Yeah. So we work uh, days and nights. Okay. Yeah. Are there always RTs yeah, on? That, yeah. And on that will shift? depend on the size of your hospital. Okay. So a really small hospital may only have an RT on during the day or they may not even have an RT. Okay. Depending on like if they're really small. So I know like the Listwell Hospital, for example, doesn't have like an inpatient RT. Okay. Because they wouldn't really have a need for it i see um yeah. whereas your larger hospitals or really any hospital that has an, an, an intensive care unit is going to have a respiratory therapist on staff 24 7 okay so yeah yeah, yeah we we staff 24 7 just yeah. like nursing would so mm -hmm. do you get moved around to you said you do some emergency room work as well or yeah yeah so then other areas that you can be assigned to would be emergency room okay um that when you're working in emergency room can be much more flexible in terms of what you're doing so your day might be pretty chill and that not much comes in that okay. particular day or you can be run off your feet the whole day okay it really can be hit or miss as to what your day is going to look like um and cases can be anything from um you know kid with asthma coming in and you're giving them breathing treatments okay. to uh sedations where we're sedating patients to like reset a broken bone or something oh, like yeah. that um, a respiratory therapist is usually present for that procedure because okay. there's a risk with sedation that a patient gets over sedated and they stop breathing oh i see so the rt might need to intervene and you know breathe for them for a little bit using a mask a bag mask okay. valve resuscitator mm -hmm. so in that situation are you just like watching if case something happens pretty or are you much, actively yeah. involved as well yeah okay. no in in sedation cases pretty much my job is to just monitor the patient okay. and make yeah. sure that they're stable throughout the sedation mm -hmm. and then that frees up the physician to do the actual procedure whether it's resetting a shoulder or a broken bone um whatever yeah um and then other cases would be those larger cases that come in to the resuscitation room where you're actually having to, you know, start life support or whatever. Okay. Uh, that we'd be involved in that as well. So that would be like a, a an emergency, like heart attack or something like that? or um, Yeah. It's depending on how severe the heart attack is or like if they've gone into full-blown arrest, um, some heart attacks are like they're having a heart attack but they don't they wouldn't need to be intubated oh, for I example because okay. they you know are still breathing and like that end of things is fine and they're still awake and alert and everything so that would be treated much differently yeah yeah, yeah. so it just depends on the severity of the patient and yeah what what they present like yeah are uh most of the things that you've seen that you see pretty routine or do you occasionally get something i mean you've just been working a few years i guess but have you seen anything that's like whoa this is completely new and i haven't seen this before yeah there's a fair amount that's fairly routine mm -hmm. um but you will definitely always have those cases that are just bizarre or okay. out of the ordinary or you just haven't seen in a really long time um so those are always interesting and exciting in mm -hmm. one one respect but then also a little bit uh, not terrifying but just they stretch you right when, yeah. when they happen 
Um, so like an example of this, I guess an unusual case that I, now this has been quite a while ago, but um, this doesn't actually happen that often because, sorry, I guess I should clarify what I'm saying. Um, this would be uh, NPOD is what we call it. So non-perfused organ donation. So okay. we do a lot of organ donations, um, whether it's, you know, hearts, kidneys, that type of thing. Okay. Um, but one organ that doesn't get donated that often are lungs. Okay. Because yeah. they're very finicky. Um, they, they have to be just, they pretty much have to be pristine in order okay. for them to be transplanted to another patient. And lung transplants are one of the riskier transplant procedures. Okay. Um, so it doesn't happen that often that when a patient is being assessed for transplant that they decide, okay, we are also going to take the lungs. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, quite a while ago, I was involved in a case where they did decide to take the lungs. Mm -hmm. So that involved taking the patient to the operating room. They had to, you know, open up the chest and like, I'm there and, you know, you're able to see inside and see wow. all the organs and everything like that. Um, and then they do various things during that procedure where they will ask you to inflate the lungs to a certain amount of pressure, and then they'll inflate them to a different pressure level. So then that was my job okay. was to wow. set the machine at the specific pressure level that the surgeon wanted for whatever, uh, they were in, in checking essentially they're inspecting the lungs for okay. tears or you know punctures that type of thing yeah. so, so we're you using a ventilator for that or that's right okay yeah, yeah. so you use a ventilator to do that yeah, yeah. which is i guess why... that makes sense why you called it a fancy air compressor or whatever you yeah would, exactly you refer to it if yeah that's, pretty that's... much when you think about it what a ventilator does all is all that it does is it pushes air in okay to the yeah. lungs and then uh it comes out yeah uh, all, kind of on its own yeah which is actually the opposite of how we normally breathe. So when we breathe spontaneously, like without a ventilator, right. what we're actually doing is our muscles are generating negative pressure okay. in our thorax. So when you breathe in, the air is actually more or less being sucked in, for lack of a better way of explaining it, mm -hmm. or it's like falling into your lungs. And then when you breathe out, it's being pushed out as your chest compresses or the, um, the lungs, the lungs are elastic. So they want to come back to okay. a certain, uh, position. So when they've been expanded, they want to automatically kind of collapse again. Okay. Yep. Um, so how is that different so from then, what a ventilator? Yeah. Doing? So then a ventilator, uh, is essentially pushing the air in oh, as okay. opposed to the air, like falling in. So when we breathe spontaneously, the air is being more or less sucked in. Right. But then when we have a patient hooked up to a ventilator, we're actually pushing the air in. Okay. So the mechanism is different. So this does play around with pressures in the thoracic cavity a little bit, and it can actually have an impact on the heart and blood pressure. So if we have too much pressure in the lungs, um, you can actually cause detrimental effects to your blood pressure and to your heart. Oh, okay. So it's something that we have to be aware of when we're ventilating. I see. Um, in most patients, this is not an issue, but okay. in patients that are severely sick or very, very ill, um, in particular, if they have a lot of underlying cardiac issues, okay. this is actually something that can cause problems I and see. make it difficult to ventilate them appropriately. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what did you call that, uh, that procedure where you did the the lung transplant yeah it's called n-pod so non-perfusing organ donation okay so what yeah. does the non-perfusing mean so essentially like when they remove the lungs they um are they aren't able to perfuse them as in they aren't able to like put blood like circulate blood through oh, them. oh okay so it's non-perfusing and that once once they're harvested the organ is no longer getting blood flow. So you have to maintain the integrity of the lungs in other ways. So um, the one that I was in, they actually put the lung in this specialized dome um, okay. looking device that provided it with like the right amount of oxygen, the right amount of pressure, the right amount of, I don't know exactly what they were all controlling with that, but 
because the lung is a pretty delicate tissue, right. they have to maintain it um, with like, but without being able to pump blood through it. Yeah. 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 So that's guess... why, that's why it's called non-perfusion. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I always assume that those procedures are incredibly complex, but I just have no idea what all goes into yeah. to that being possible. It's really yeah. incredible. It, that... It's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really fascinating. So I was, I was very privileged to be able to be a part of that. Yeah. And did you say you had like not been doing it that long when you? Yeah, that would have been uh, pretty early on when I would have started. Yeah, it's been been a while now. That's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Any other stories of of anything unusual or fascinating that you've gotten to experience? I guess it's really hard to like a lot of what we do. I suppose is kind of unusual. Right. Yeah. Um, So it's really hard (laughs) to like what seems normal to me would probably seem unusual. That's well, yeah. yeah, and like I said, I've what we've been talking about here and and yeah. so much new th- new things for me so it's great yeah e- each case so that's one of the things that i like about being an rt is each case has its um own peculiarities okay so yeah. each case like each patient you want to view them as an individual case right. and um you want to figure out like ex- what's going on with this patient or like why um yeah yeah, that uh, makes sense. Yeah. Well, this is maybe a, a good question. Um, um, I put down here, what's the most difficult part of your job? So there's several ways you could have taken it. Um, it could either be like, what do you find difficult or um, different procedures or that thing. But I, you, you also could answer it as far as what you don't enjoy about mm-hmm. your job. There's most jobs. Um, there's something that it's not enjoyable or right so it's up to you i guess how you answer that but what do you find difficult about your job yeah i would say one thing um and this would be just to mention if for anyone that's maybe considering a field like respiratory therapy um one of the hardest parts about the job is dealing with death Mm -hmm. in it um i would say we disproportionately see a lot more death than maybe other people in the right. medical field um, just due to the fact that we work with usually the most critically mm-hmm. ill patients in the hospital. And by um, that, do you mean that you'll be with a patient when they pass away? So the RT will, yes, actually be. Um, so when you hear about a patient being withdrawn from life support, right. um, whether, yeah. so that's usually involves taking them off of a ventilator. Mm-hmm. So uh, part of my job is also doing that right uh, so that would be yeah removing the breathing tube in order to allow patient to pass away for mm-hmm. example um that can be it's a it's a um i still get emotional when when i have to do that yeah um and it's probably mostly due because often we will allow the family to be there um okay. so just seeing families reactions so um that's definitely something to be aware of uh, that it's part of the job um, to, yeah. to participate in that. And so just being around that more often than you normally would, yeah. um, that can be, it can be easy to get maybe jaded to it in some way. Mm-hmm. So I, I always try to maintain the humanity, uh, when right. I am involved in a situation like that, like remember that this is a person as yeah. well. Um, and so you want them to die with dignity. So you don't go about doing this just haphazardly right, or yeah. just at nonchalantly. You want to do it respectfully yeah. as well. So do you, mm-hmm. do you allow yourself to feel some of the emotion of it? Like, do you think I, that's important? I try to, I think that's important. Yeah. Um, I know some people try to say, shut off your emotions in those scenarios. Don't like think about it at all for me i feel like that that would lead me into this like it would just i would lose the human touch i think too quickly and i think that's that would not be a good thing i can yeah and i can see how it'd be important to have a good balance there of Mm -hmm. of not being too caught up in the emotion but also yeah like you said you don't want it right and i don't think a patient's family would appreciate if you're just treating it as exactly. oh this is just another it just part another of the job. part of the is, job yeah, yeah. yeah i i think it's very important to treat the family members especially with respect and let them know that you are sympathizing yeah. with them at this time yeah do you have a lot of interaction with with family mm-hmm. and that kind of thing or is that more a physician's role 
so generally the physician will be the one to explain um, what's happening okay. or kind of if if there's a decision that needs to be made usually it's the physician having that discussion with the family about helping them work through the decisions that need to be made um, so I don't have to do that um, however I will talk with family members in uh, as it relates to specifically maybe the ventilator or the plan for the patient in that regard so okay. what's the plan in terms of weaning the patient from ventilation mm -hmm. or like how well they're doing in that regard um so i will often talk with families about that for sure yeah oh very good yeah thanks for thanks for sharing that i mm -hmm. that makes sense you're working in um intensive care and and working with critical patients but um mm -hmm. i hadn't thought about it that that you'd be dealing a lot more with with patients dying than probably a lot of a lot of people would so it's... yeah yeah it's just something to be aware of yeah. for anyone thinking about the field yeah that it is something now that's not to say so there are respiratory like there are rt jobs that you can get that would have very little right. of that um for sure yeah yeah so on the other side of things what do you find the most enjoyable about your job mm -hmm. um i really like the variety Mm -hmm. in the work actually so my job can consist of yeah running to a code being involved in like a high stress clinical scenario to educating a patient mm -hmm. on their asthma or copd mm -hmm. um, their medications that they're taking on that or like lifestyle changes that oh, type yeah. of thing to working with a newborn infant in the nursery and seeing, you know, the parents and yeah. how excited they are about this new life. Uh, and uh, so I just love the variety. Yeah. Um, there's a variety of skills that you get to perform um, and a wide variety of clinical scenarios. Yeah. So I, that part I really love. And just in general, I like, um, well, we kind of, we kind of see, like, we see ourselves as, kind of the breath of life i guess yeah. so to so to speak and like i just enjoy that aspect of rt like knowing that what i do has the potential to save someone's life yeah um and so it's really very rewarding um actually uh talking like having gone through covid and seeing some of these patients um i there's a patient that i distinctly remember who was on a ventilator for weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm. And there were multiple times when we thought this patient wasn't going to make it. Um, but he did. Okay. He pulled through and is off the ventilator and is fine. Nice. And like yeah. walked out of the hospital fully intact. Um, not fully. Unfortunately, there will be long-term effects um, from, from COVID, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But... Um, just to see that is so rewarding yeah. to like be a part of that and be a part of literally saving someone's life yeah. is it's, a, it's really, really rewarding. Yeah. That's great. So this, uh, this, these next few questions I have might touch on some things that we've talked about um, mm -hmm. a little bit. So you, you can uh, decide how, how much you think is relevant here. But um, yeah, I'm interested in knowing, maybe getting into some a few of the, the more specifics of, of some of the things that you do. Um, so what, yeah, maybe just tell us again or give us a little more detail on some of the things that, that you study, some of the things that you're involved in, in specifically um, the, the parts of the human body that you work with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I had mentioned before, um, that in school we studied, um, general human anatomy and physiology, right. but then we also took, um, very specialized anatomy and physiology courses. So, um, we took courses specifically on pulmonary, um, pathophysiology or like lung so essentially covering all the lung diseases that okay. are yep. possibly out there okay uh, pretty much every single one of them yeah and then we also took specialized courses in cardiovascular so cardiac uh, issues that type of thing so that's the heart and blood vessels or yeah yeah, yeah and circulatory system that type yeah. of thing so 
I would say the RT program definitely gets into more detail mm -hmm. in that aspect of things than maybe um, a nursing program might. A nursing right. program would look at these at more of a higher level, um, less specialized, right. whereas RT program would delve into a little bit more detail on some of these. Um, it's one of the things that uh, is just a little bit different in terms of the thinking of an RT versus a nurse. So an RT always is thinking more specialized within yeah. our within our specialty so we're thinking um how are these various medical issues that the patient is facing so for example say they have a cardiac history mm -hmm. um, we're thinking how is that going to impact their breathing for example so if a patient right. is in uh, cardiac failure or heart failure or congestive heart failure we often call it that can cause fluid to back up into the lungs okay for instance uh, pulmonary edema and we might treat that by providing them with something called BiPAP which is essentially a mask that you would put on someone's face um, it's a fairly large mask and it seals around the nose and the mouth okay and we can then deliver pressure um, so whether it's a straight pressure, usually we give them uh, what we call two different pressure levels. So it'll give them a higher pressure when they breathe in, and then it's a bit of a lower pressure level when they breathe okay. out. And essentially this um, machine helps them with their breathing, but it also allows, um, for lack of a better way of explaining it, it can help push the fluid that's built up in the lungs back into the circulatory system oh okay um and it can actually help them clear out their lungs now the physiology that's a very crude way of explaining what yeah. happens it doesn't actually literally pu push the fluid back into the circulatory system <laughs> okay yeah but um but it allows it to happen it or, allows it to yeah. happen it kind of facilitates that yeah. process um this is often coupled with um something called lasix which is a diuretic which would cause uh, patients to essentially create more urine okay and then that would also take fluid off okay so rts are always thinking kind of at, the, at this more uh, like a more focused level mm -hmm. like that so i might actually make a recommendation for late like if, if i've been consulted for a patient for breathing difficulty mm -hmm. um, i might actually make a recommendation for something like lasix based on my evaluation of the patient and okay. what i think is going on like recognizing that there are other organ systems involved that can cause difficulty of breathing not not everything that causes difficulty of breathing is because of the lungs it can okay, be because yeah. of other things yeah so rts would focus more on understanding those other causes of why a patient might have difficulty breathing okay yeah no that's yeah and that's as you were as you've been talking over the last little bit, I've kind of been catching on that that the things that you study and and need to know are are definitely focused on the, the heart and lungs. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so some of those those things come together. Yeah. So maybe along those lines, then, and you, um, I think you somewhat answered my next question already. But when you were talking about with a ventilator, how it works the opposite of how how we breathe naturally right and um so that just told me that you have a better understanding of of how our breath works and mm -hmm. and how those things work but um yeah for this next question i don't know if you can how well you can pull it out because often when we get deep into something we um understand it so well that that we forget kind of what it's like for those that that haven't studied it in depth and, mm -hmm. and understand it but can you pick out anything that that you now really understand well that um that other people might, might not know that um so i don't know if i guess i was maybe thinking about here with general living or or um ways that our bodies work naturally mm. um is there is there things that you've uh, you've picked up on from your from your work and study yeah, I don't know that I would have anything specific for that, to be honest. Um, I guess one thing in terms of maybe something that's second nature to me mm -hmm. or something like that, in terms of my work, um, one thing that I've developed or one thing that, yeah, one skill that I've developed as an RT is kind of the really quick kind of the assessment from the door. We call it the doorway assessment okay, yep. where you quickly take a look at a patient 
and the question you ask yourself is essentially does this patient need intervention right now like are they in serious trouble right now or can it like is there time so oh, okay. that yeah. that would be something i think that has become like second yeah. nature to so my the, to my assessment this is the first time you're the first you're time seeing you're a new patient or, yeah, yeah so like if i'm being called to emergency room mm-hmm. to see and assess a patient you never know what you're walking into okay so the first thing i like to do is take a quick look at my patient from the doorway do what i call the doorway exam mm-hmm. and ask myself that question is there intervention that needs to be done right this second yeah. or can i take more time to do a more detailed exam so i guess just is that assessing breathing or what are you what are you looking for when you're doing that um so you kind of take in a wide variety of things yeah okay. breathing skin color oh, um, yeah. the patient's posture even okay do they look like they're in obvious distress of any kind um yeah there would be a variety of things that you would kind of look for. Yeah. So that would be maybe something that kind of is becoming, I don't know that I would say it's fully second nature yet right. uh, for me, but it's definitely a skill that is de- like a skill that you have to develop as an RT. For yeah. Sure. Do you ever, um, I have no idea what your answer will be to this, but do you ever find yourself like kind of mentally diagnosing people out in public like when you're not doing your job at all like <laughs> listening to breathing or anything like that or i i do sometimes okay. yeah i will yeah i'll see people you know you know walking through walmart or whatever and they're clearly having difficulty breathing and i can hear like audible wheezes uh-huh. and i'm just like you should probably take a puffer right now okay. or whatever yeah. or i'll i don't know i'll see a patient with a really short thick neck or something and be like oh that would be really hard to intubate that (laughs) type of a patient yeah yeah. you know things like that yeah i I would say i kind of do that sometimes yeah it's good um you've talked about some of the diseases um that you see and this might be a, a time to ask you um about what the what COVID has meant for you in your, your mm. specific field. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, what are some of the diseases that you, that you see regularly? What are some of the things that you're dealing with? Yeah. Um, so typical cases that we would deal with, um, CHF or congestive heart failure okay. would be a pretty big one. Um, often these are patients that we can hopefully turn around relatively quickly with a little bit of Lasix and BiPAP, as I had mentioned before. Mm-hmm. So it's a fairly common uh, ER Okay. Complaint, something that comes into the ER quite a bit, um, COPD or a- and asthma exacerbation. So okay. COPD. I was just yes, asking what yeah. that is. Yeah. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Okay. So the key word in that is, or a couple of keywords will be chronic, and obstructive. So these are diseases that the patient has had for a long time, mm-hmm. and that are causing an obstruction of some kind. So the most common of these that we would see a lot would be emphysema. Um, And specifically, emphysema essentially causes your lung to lose its elasticity. So that um, ability of it to kind of uh, collapse on its own. So your lung loses its elasticity. And then what ends up happening is these patients, because their lung doesn't collapse on its own, they have to kind of force the air out a little bit more themselves by using some of their accessory muscles. And if they do that um, too much, it can actually cause obstruction or constriction in some of the airways. Okay. And it will lead to things like air trapping um, where they have too much air left in their lungs that they can't get out. Uh, mm -hmm. This is very common in smokers. So smoking is the leading cause of emphysema. Okay. Um, so pretty much anyone that's been a lifelong smoker is going to have an element of emphysema. There's also an anti, uh, uh, one anti, uh, anti trypsin one, I forget exactly okay. the name of it, but it's a, um, genetic, uh, abnormality okay. that can also cause something very similar, So, but just, that's much more rare. Just to connect your terms here, emphysema, that's referring to that last, that, that, um, lack of elasticity Elasticity. okay yeah yeah yeah. more more or less yeah Yeah. um as opposed to 
asthma. Mm-hmm. So asthma would also be considered an obstructive um, disorder because okay. it causes it causes an obstruction in the lungs. Um, but that obstruction is due to a hyper reaction of the muscles in the um, small in in the airways. Okay. So your smooth muscle tissue that's surrounding certain parts of your airway is reacting and constricting and in constricting it's causing your airways to get smaller oh and then that's causing an obstruction so then uh, what we often give for that is something called ventolin the blue puffer Um, anyone that is an asthmatic would know about the blue puffer Mm -hmm. Um, that's your rescue puffer your rescue inhaler and what that medication does is it essentially acts to release those muscles okay. or to relax those muscles mm-hmm. and it allows the airways to open back up again so essentially someone with asthma is not able to get enough air in um because... actually it's almost the other way around it's oh, almost okay. getting the air out yeah. can actually be almost more of the struggle than getting the okay. air in but yes uh, it does work a bit both ways but getting the air out can okay. be just as big of an issue um so those would be obstructive disorders. And then we would also work with disorders that are called restrictive disorders. So this would be something like pulmonary fibrosis. And what these disorders do is they essentially uh, limit your lung capacity. So they restrict your lung capacity or like how much air you can get in and out of your lungs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, So when we had talked earlier about diagnostics and pulmonary function testing, Mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're looking for on a pulmonary function test is whether you have an obstructive or a restrictive disorder. Okay. Um, And it's very clearly, um, there are very clear markers on a pulmonary function test that would tell you which one it is. Yeah. 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 So how does, how does COVID fit into, is it one of those? Yeah. Things that you've talked about or does it cause one of them? Yeah. So COVID would kind of fit into um, another category of diseases that we would see, which would be infectious diseases, right? So um, COVID is a viral infection um, that primarily targets lung tissue. Okay. Um, So essentially it creates... So then... These tend to, the viral or bacterial infections, tend to create more of a restrictive effect okay. where they're restricting the lung. They aren't necessarily obstructing. So it's more of a restrictive lung picture. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in terms of COVID treatment and like how it looks in the ICU, um, these are types of patients, COVID patients, the very severe ones anyway, are suffering from severe hypoxia so essentially they have very low oxygen levels okay in their blood um so our main goal is to maintain their oxygenation okay um there are other goals as well but at least in terms of my concern as an rt my main concern is to maintain their oxygenation initially when covid was happening the initial thought was to intubate early you probably would have heard that maybe in the news a couple of times um to intubate early and kind of get ahead of things while while you still can so that they're not lacking oxygen right yeah that was the initial thought um it turns out that we actually want to avoid intubation in covid patients because we found out so when you intubate someone you have to sedate and paralyze them and that whole process, um, most COVID patients, if they were quite severe, that whole process um, can cause more harm okay. than help, actually. Gotcha. So then the consensus, consensus became to avoid intubation, if you at all could. So it was just a last resort That's at right. that point? Okay. That's right. Yeah. So then we started treating these patients more with um, a therapy that I haven't really talked about yet, um, high-flow oxygen. So okay. um, when you're thinking about oxygen therapy, most people think about the nasal prongs, you know, the little prongs that go right, in yeah. your nose. Um, you can really only turn those up to a certain flow level usually we limit it at six liters per minute okay um with high flow oxygen therapy and sorry i should say the reason why we only limit it at six is because oxygen causes a lot of drying so if you're pumping oxygen in 
to your nose, like pretty much pure oxygen, you're going to dry out the nose. You're going to get lots of nose bleedings. It's going to oh, be okay. very uncomfortable for your patient. Mm -hmm. So in order to give more oxygen through the nose, um, we end up having to add humidification to that. So we okay. add heated humidification and special circuits and that type of thing with like temperature probes on them to monitor temperatures and humidity levels. Um, and we can now, using that type of technology, you can give way more flow to your okay. patients and much higher oxygen levels to your patients. Okay. And then that way you can support their oxygen needs without actually having to intubate them. Okay. Um, because yeah. with a lot of these patients, it's really just the oxygenation that they need help with. Okay. It's not the actual breathing or the muscles of breathing. So in that regard, they don't need a breathing machine to take over their breathing. Yeah. Um, they really just need help with the oxygenation. Um, so how many... How much oxygen can you get in with that method? Uh, up to like literally 100%. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You can give them pure oxygen um, with that method. Yeah. yeah. Now, and how many liters uh, you'd said? Well, yeah, I forget what the six, unit was, but six. Yeah, it was six liters per minute for a normal nasal cannula. On high flow therapy, you can go up to 60. Oh, okay. Yeah, so 10 60. times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 10 times the amount. Yeah. So you can give up to 60 liters and 100%. Now, mm -hmm. once you're at that level, um, that, and if your patient is still failing um, their oxygenation, then you're going to need to look at um, intubating them at okay. that point because they clearly need even more support than that, which would involve things like, you know, pressure. Okay. Like, and you yeah. can't you can't give pressure with a high flow nasal okay. cannula. Yeah. Yeah. So have um has have you seen better results since you've moved to that therapy from from ventilating early or that kind of thing or I would say anecdotally, yes. Okay. Um yeah. at least based on my observations that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. I would say that that has resulted in better outcomes. Nice. Well, it's mm -hmm. great how I mean it's not nice if if um for the people that had it first mm -hmm. essentially but it's it's neat to see that that you learn things and then mm -hmm. can develop and and um yeah and provide better treatment then the other therapy that we did a lot with covid was what we call pronation so we're turning these patients onto their stomachs or putting them into prone position okay um, this is actually a technique that we had used before covid um mm -hmm. we have used it multiple times before COVID, but in with COVID patients in particular, um, it seems to help a lot. Okay. And so essentially what's happening is you're matching up your perfusion and your ventilation in your lungs. So if you're on your back, most of your perfusion is along the back part okay. of your lungs, whereas most of your air or the ventilation is towards the front or the anterior. Okay. So your ventilation is anterior, your perfusion or blood flow is posterior. Okay. Um, most of your perfusion is posterior. That's where your largest surface area of your lungs are. Um, so if you flip your patient because air rises, now most of your oh, okay. ventilation is also going to be posterior and it's going to be better matched with your perfusion, which is where your blood flow is going okay. to be. So your blood flow is going to stay posterior, but your ventilation now when you're on your stomach is going to be matched with your perfusion. So it's better what we call VQ or ventilation perfusion okay. uh, matching. And then it just seems to really help uh, with your patients as well. So yeah, we found mean... that that is key uh, to treating these patients so often patients that are non-intubated and are requiring a lot of oxygen that have covid we would highly encourage them to self-prone okay. or to lay on their stomach for as long of a period of time as they could so whether that's like two to four hours and then flip onto their back for a little bit for a bit of a break and then go back to their stomach okay. uh, yeah. patients that can do that really benefit yeah, that's very good. Anything else that you wanted to say on diseases there? Or does that sum it up pretty well? Um, I guess, so those would be like more adult um, oh, true, diseases yeah. that we were focused on. And then in terms of infants, um, a couple of 
things that we do. Um, so RDS or respiratory distress syndrome is a common um, disease that we have to be able to deal with for infants. And so essentially okay. what this is caused from when an infant is born is uh, in our, in our lungs, we have something called surfactant and surfactant is a material that keeps our lungs essentially compliant and mm -hmm. essentially allows oxygen. It helps with, you know, oxygen getting through uh, the lungs into the bloodstream. So depending on if a baby is born too premature, mm -hmm. they may not actually have a lot of surfactant in their lungs okay. yet. Their lungs might be underdeveloped um, and this is going to cause them to run into breathing difficulties. Okay. So what we can actually do with these infants is we can deliver surfactant directly to their lungs. Oh, okay. So we'll put in a breathing tube just for the purposes of delivering surfactant. We'll push surfactant through the breathing tube directly into their lungs and then you use a bag to like bag it in so that it gets distributed evenly and then you pull out the breathing tube. Um, and the turnaround is actually almost instantaneous oh, really? when you wow. do this. Like if you like had, you'll see them go from not breathing well to breathing well? Yeah, like okay. their, their work of breathing will improve, their oxygenation will immediately improve. Wow. So say they were requiring like 40% oxygen, you'll immediately be able to turn them down into room air okay. if it's working. It's, a, it's really quite fascinating wow. to see. Um, the other really cool thing about this um, is it... There are different types of surfactant, but in Ontario, um, we use one that actually was researched and developed in London, and it's called bovine lipid extract surfactant, and it literally comes from cow lung. Okay. So it's it's really cool. So the surfactant that we use in hospital for infants um, is harvested, like in London, Ontario. Ontario. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, from cows. Okay. Yeah, from the lungs of cows. I see. And wow. we, we use it in hospitals. So I think that's a pretty cool little trivia thing about yeah. local about connection. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are those are like very newborns that Yeah, that often those will be pre um, Oh yeah, you they'll said often that, be yeah. premature yeah. infants. Um, lung development is one of the last things to okay. develop in utero. Um, so the lungs are the last thing to pre like mature. Yeah. Um, what will often happen if a premature delivery is expected, but there's still a little bit of time, like a day or two, mm -hmm. um, the doctor will often prescribe to the mom a steroid of some kind, okay. often dexamethasone. And essentially what that does is it promotes, um, maturity of the lung in the infant oh, okay. or in the, in, um, in utero. And actually, you can get as much as like an extra week's worth of lung development in as short as one day. Oh, I see. If you give the mom steroid yeah. like that. So it can be uh, quite useful. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's very good and fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I like to, to see if there's any advice that you can pass on to uh, to us regular people especially if uh or ways that um that maybe we can benefit even if we don't know much about respiratory therapy so from your job have you picked up anything that um that as far as advice that you can pass on for just healthier living in general mm -hmm. so from your from your knowledge and experience that you've gained i guess like my because my position is more specialized, I tend to have more focused conversations with patients on this. So often my conversations with patients will revolve around things like smoking cessation. Um, vaping is a one that comes up fairly frequently okay. as well. And that I would see in like younger people. Is tend that, to be more is that pretty hard on the lungs too? Or it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the problem with vaping is the particle size is actually smaller than when you're smoking. So okay. cigarette particle size, average particle size versus vaping okay. particle size. So these particles can actually penetrate deeper into oh, the lungs. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, there are also the chemical composition of certain vapes um, are more prone to causing, you know, more irritation to lung tissue, okay. um, that type of thing. Yeah. So, so is your advice on that always stop? with vaping much. and smoking yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> if yes stop 
Yeah. Yeah. Or don't start. Yeah. Or... And there are benefits. So even if you've, you know, been smoking for many, many years, okay. by stopping, you there is still a benefit to okay. it. Like even if you smoked for 30 years. There's whatever, no point in saying, oh, I've done it all my life. So that's I might right. As well keep There's doing... still a benefit to okay. stopping. Yeah. You will regain, you can regain lung, lung function just by stopping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your lungs are pretty resilient um to to that so they'll they'll be able to improve yeah and so these are so when you you see the effects of smoking vaping that kind of thing are you you're talking about things besides just lung cancer here like there's other negative negative effects that you see that's right yeah Yeah, so lung cancer certainly a concern but in general it would be more the chronic long-term effects of these that i would be more concerned about um Smoking in particular is definitely is linked to emphysema, Mm -hmm. um, as I kind of mentioned earlier. And it's just not a pleasant, like whenever I see severe emphysema, it's just incredibly uncomfortable um, for the patient that's struggling with that. Um, And there it's just, yeah, they've had irreversible damage at that point. Okay. Um, So like, Yes, your lungs are resist- resilient, but there is a point where you'll also reach irreversible damage uh, yeah. due to these things. Yeah. 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 Yeah, nice. Any other advice for healthy living that you have? Um, I guess in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of like breathing things, um, if you have asthma or something like that, or even allergies, just know what your triggers are, I suppose, Mm. like what triggers your asthma. Just being aware of that type of thing can help you out. Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like most asthmatics do that. Right. Uh, I would know that, but that would be a piece of advice as well as work with your medical team, your doctor. Mm. Um, Yeah, getting on the right medical uh, regimen or whatever if you need certain puffers like no it it doesn't work the same way for everyone okay so yeah. um you might what worked for one patient might not work for you so just okay. be yeah. open with your physician about that when you're talking with them well that's actually a a, a nice segue into my ne- my next question here so um like i i don't know how many people regularly interact with respiratory therapists but is there anything that you would like people to know or that could make your job easier or mm. advice that you could give for for when when we maybe do have to um interact with your profession mm-hmm. it's a uh, it's an interesting question <laughs> uh, i feel like a lot of people that interact with me don't have a choice right in, yeah. in their way in interacting with me unfortunately yeah it's true. at least in the position that i'm in right now it's um usually because they're in more of a severe medical crisis so i guess the main the main thing would be just take care of yourself and try and stay healthy Mm -hmm. in order to prevent yourself (laughs) from getting to that stage where you would need a like an rt um yeah usually if you're the one needing the rt at the hospital that's not a good thing yeah unfortunately yeah. yeah 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 um so I've I've uh, learned a lot here um, over the the last while as you've been informing me the the different things that you do the different um, diseases um, that you run into the treatments that, that you do for them the the regular procedures that you do so so uh, thank you for it and it's been mm-hmm. fascinating to hear how your um, your yeah your start and music and and focus on that and then hear your story of how you how you transitioned into medical studies and uh and and where you are um here as well so um yeah i just wanted to give you a chance yet to um to promote um anything if you anything you'd like to say so uh, what did you want to talk about there yeah um I, yeah the whole music things i'm i'm still keep that very present in my life i, yeah, no, I love great. music and so i i have a few avenues that i keep that going through um i guess in terms of maybe something to promote uh, this may or may not be relevant to to listeners depending on where you are i suppose but uh one project that i'm involved in right now that i really am having a great time and really enjoy is um millbank heritage and arts society <laughs> Um, We're a small organization in Millbank, Ontario, and we 
essentially our focus is we want to promote arts and uh, the history of Millbank, okay. um, that type of thing. So now, unfortunately, this year we didn't get to do a lot of what we right. normally would have done. Uh, but in the past, we've done things like um, youth, like a, a drama for kids mm -hmm. in the Millbank area. Um, they did uh, Line the Witch, and, uh, sorry, yeah, the Line the Witch in the Wardrobe one year, and um, the Wizard of Oz another time. Nice. So if you have kids that are in the Millbank area that are would like to be in a play or something like that, uh, check check out nice. Millbank Heritage and Arts. And uh, yeah, we have programming like that. We have a bit of programming for seniors as well. We've hosted again this year got canceled, but uh, we generally like to host senior seniors luncheons uh, oh, nice. for anyone that's uh, would consider themselves senior i suppose um so that's something that we like to do we do community events uh, community hymn sings mm, nice. um so pretty much if you're in the mobank area and have been wanting to find ways to get connected with your community or community events that type of thing check us out um we do actually have a fundraiser coming up in september september 19th um, which we'll, we'll be putting out posters oh, nice. soon about that, but it'll be a fundraiser for us uh, nice. so that we can essentially keep the building open. Um, yeah. So, so are you going to be able to go ahead with that? Um, at this point, yeah, yeah, we're structuring it in a way that it's not, it's essentially going to be a drive through takeout oh, nice. meal. Oh, um, neat. Yeah. So you can like order, you know, however many meals you want and then just drive through and pick them up. Yeah. 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 So, uh, do you have a, is there a musical component to there is, yeah. Often, well? often a lot of our events will feature or have a place for people to perform. So, oh, okay. like for yeah. example, at a seniors luncheon, we'll ask a local um, performer to come and whatever. Oh, yeah. Play, sing, that type of thing. Um, so you use it as a way for people to showcase their talents. And yeah, things. yeah. And we've hosted a community talent show oh, in nice. the past. Yeah. Uh, we've hosted that twice now. Um, and so, yeah, if you are, uh, I'm not sure when we're going to do our next one. Right, we would yeah. like to do our next one at some point. Not yeah. exactly sure when that will be happening. But uh, anyway, so I just wanted to put the word out there that such a thing exists. Yeah. Um, no, and great. that, yeah, it's a way that if, especially if you're in the Milverton Millbank area, um, it's something that you can check out and uh, get involved. No, that's fantastic. And uh, I appreciate the the work that you've done on uh, on both the art side and um, all the, the work that you're doing in medical field and um, helping people out in that way too. And mm -hmm. thanks for coming and uh, and sharing your knowledge with us as well. I've uh, I've certainly learned a lot and I hope that others will too. So no thank problem. you for that. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you everyone for listening and thank you Cam for sharing your knowledge with us. I feel like I now understand so much more about the respiratory therapy profession and also know a lot more about how the respiratory system works and how it connects with the rest of our, the body. So thank you so much, Cam, for sharing that with us. Thank you to those of you that have connected with the show, either talking to me in person or sending me emails or messages. I really appreciate that. And it's great to, to hear how, how others of you are um, learning from my guests as well. So that's great. Keep that up. You can send me an email at contact at everydayexpertise.ca and also check out the website everydayexpertise.ca for show notes or more information about the podcast. That's all for now. Join me again next week to learn from the expertise of everyday people.